Hey everyone, it's Elisa and I have another step two question for you. Go ahead and pause this, answer it on your own, and then come back and we'll do it together. A 59-year-old multi-paris woman comes to the physician because of urinary leakage for the past 10 months. She involuntarily loses a small amount of urine after experiencing a sudden cramping sensation in her bladder. She often has difficulty making it to the bathroom in time. She has been woken up several times at night by a strong feeling of her bladder being full. She denies burning, itching, hematuria, abdominal pain, or pelvic pain. Menopause was nine years ago. She's not on HRT. She works as a night nurse and drinks three to four cups of coffee at work. On physical exam, there's no suprapubic tenderness. Pelvic exam is normal. Q-tip test is normal. Ultrasound shows normal post-void residual urine. So what's going on with this patient? And our options are stress incontinence, urinary tract infection, decreased, decreased pelvic floor muscle tone, excuse me, increased urine bladder volume, or increased detrusor muscle activity. So let's look at this patient. She's a postmenopausal woman. She has a normal physical exam. She has a normal uh, pelvic exam. And she has normal bladder volume. And all we know that's important is that she has episodic random loss of urine with some cramping. So let's kind of think about these options, right? So the first one is stress incontinence. Now, the reason they tell you about the Q-tip test, which we will review, is that the Q-tip test is a, um, it's a test for stress incontinence. So a Q-tip is placed into the urethra, the patient is asked to valsalva, which is breathe out against a closed glottis. Um, and if the Q-tip moves more than 30 degrees, it's positive and the patient is, um, positive for stress incontinence, but she has none of this. And also her leakage of urine is unrelated to coughing, laughing, sneezing, any of those classic things. So it's likely not A. So we can go ahead and cross out A. B is a UTI. So a UTI can also cause urinary incontinence because of um, inflammation and, um, you know, pain and difficulty urinating. Uh, however, the patient lacks any signs of a urinary tract infection, so she doesn't have, she doesn't have dysuria, no hematuria, no burning, um, none of that. Again, we don't know her labs, and they didn't do a urinary analysis, but this is kind of, you know, we're not thinking a UTI at this point. Next option is decreased pelvic floor muscle tone. Now, the reason I included this is because I'm Sometimes uh, the exam writers give you two identical options. They just word them a little differently. So stress incontinence and decreased pelvic floor muscle tone are essentially saying the same thing. Um, and that way you can cross out two answers uh, at once because you, know, you can't choose one of them because the other one is also right and you can't choose two answers uh, on an exam. They can't grade that. Um, so, you, great, you just crossed out 40% of the options. Now I'm left with three. So uh, decreased pelvic floor muscle tone leads to stress incontinence because the urethra and the bladder anatomically can't close against the anterior vaginal wall. And remember, the uterus um, lies on top of the bladder, usually antiverted, but it could be retroverted as well. Um, and so increases in intra-abdominal pressure forces this urine through a urethra that isn't entirely closed. Most commonly, um, decreased pelvic floor muscle tone is caused by uh, childbirth. It's the most classic one. And then, but it could also be just regular muscular weakening or even urinary tract trauma. And again, this patient doesn't have strength incontinence due to her normal Q-tip test and lack of other uh, findings. Increased urine bladder volume. That's another way of saying overflow incontinence. Um, so that's detrusor muscle underactivity, so it's not strong enough, or bladder outlet obstruction. And both of those can cause increased volumes. Uh, however, her post-void residual volume is normal, so it's likely not this. Uh, so patients with overflow incontinence also usually have like constant leaking, constant dribbling. That's something they uh, present with. This is classically uh, older men with uh, BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy. So that would be kind of like um, bladder outlet obstruction. So they have constant dribbling. And finally, our last answer is increased detrusive muscle activity, aka urge incontinence. Um, it causes involuntary muscle contraction as well as urinary tenesmus. So she complained about cramps. 
that's pretty consistent. And it leads to a sudden release of urine at very random times. So ease out, like a very good option. So let's go back. I like to cross these things off because it's, oops, because it's satisfying. And then I like to highlight the correct answer. So our answer is urge incontinence. So increased detrusive muscle activity. Uh, she has to suddenly urinate and loses a little bit of urine each time. Uh, it can also cause nocturia and is exacerbated by things like caffeine, which she has quite a lot of. Um, it the caffeine causes increased uh, daily urine and can also actually irritate the bladder lining. So we should tell her to you know, drink less coffee if she can. And then the treatment for this is an anticholinergic agent such as oxybutynin because uh, this will decrease the detrusor muscle tone by blocking the M3 receptors, which, so the detrusor muscle is parasympathetically mediated um, and hence an anticholinergic agent will do wonders for um, patients with urge incontinence. All right, thank you so much for doing this question with me and we'll see you next week.